Believe it or not, coffee used to be labeled a potential carcinogen from the 1990s to about 2016. That was wrong. The label rested on weak, confounded evidence, but acrylamide was really at the heart of it. Acrylamide is a chemical formed naturally when coffee beans are roasted, as well as during the cooking of starchy foods at high temperatures. Although acrylamide has caused cancer in lab animals at very high doses, the levels typically found in coffee pose minimal risk to humans. One standard brewed cup delivers roughly 2 to 5 micrograms of acrylamide. You'd need to drink 25 to 50 cups a day to hit the conservative reference level, which is around 2 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. What we now know is that coffee does not increase your cancer risk. In fact, it probably reduces it, particularly for certain major cancers, including liver cancer, endometrial cancer, and skin cancer. The evidence here is compelling. Each daily cup of coffee you drink is associated with roughly a 15 to 20 percent reduction in liver cancer risk and about a 10 percent lower risk of endometrial cancer, with maximum benefits seen around four to five cups per day. Even the International Agency for Research on Cancer recently acknowledged coffee's protective role, officially removing coffee from their list of possible carcinogens. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States, and it is the leading cause of death in Canada, Japan, and many Western European Union states. So it is important to pay attention to. Why does coffee have these powerful anti-cancer effects? Well, coffee doesn't just have antioxidant properties. It actively reduces DNA damage. This is one of the fundamental triggers of cancer. A compelling randomized controlled trial demonstrated that people drinking dark roast coffee daily had a 23% reduction in their DNA double-stranded breaks compared to water alone. Now, DNA double-stranded breaks are among the most severe forms of genetic damage. To give you context, this is the type of damage you typically see from ionizing radiation, the kind that directly threatens your genetic code and your chromosomes, the structures that house your DNA. And this is not just the DNA integrity at stake. Chromosomal damage directly accelerates the shortening of telomeres. These are the tiny caps that protect our chromosomes from damage, our DNA that's packaged in our chromosomes. And telomeres naturally shorten with age, but damage accelerates this process dramatically. And once the telomeres become critically short, our cells then enter a state known as senescence. This is kind of a cellular aging that not only drives the aging process itself, but also greatly increases our risk for chronic diseases, including cancer. By actively reducing DNA double-stranded breaks, coffee may not only protect against cancer directly, but also may help maintain telomere length, thereby potentially slowing cellular aging and preserving genomic stability. And in fact, studies have found that regular coffee drinkers do have longer telomeres compared to non-coffee drinkers. Mechanistically, coffee triggers our cells to activate something called NRF2. This is a master cellular switch that ramps up our body's own antioxidant defenses, including glutathione. This is enhancing our natural capacity for DNA repair. But coffee's protective effects go even broader. It also influences liver metabolism, hormone regulation, and inflammation, all critical in preventing cancers that thrive on metabolic dysfunction or hormone imbalance. Interestingly, decaffeinated coffee consistently shows similar protective effects, which strongly suggests that beneficial compounds beyond caffeine, such as polyphenols and the melanoidins, are primarily driving these anti-cancer benefits. Coffee's health effects may actually start in the gut. Each cup of coffee delivers up to 2 grams of soluble fiber, plus a pharmacy of polyphenols, chlorogenic acids, melanoidins, diterpenes, and trigonelline. In a 23,000-person nature microbiology data set, coffee was the single strongest dietary factor shaping the microbiome, enriching 115 bacterial species. One loss in Ibacter species shows up almost exclusively in habitual coffee drinkers, essentially acting as a microbial coffee fingerprint. What this bacterial species actually does is ferments coffee fiber and polyphenols into bioactive compounds, such as quinic acid conjugates and short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids tighten gut barrier integrity, dampen inflammation, and improve insulin sensitivity. And the quinic acid metabolites flip on the NRF2 switch for antioxidant activity. And in animal models, even lower PCSK9, which is a regulator of LDL cholesterol clearance. This is early data, but intriguing for heart health. So randomized controlled trials actually back this up. 
Three cups of filtered coffee per day for eight weeks increased bifidobacterium and fecally bacterium abundance. These are both major short-chain fatty acid producers. And it did this without harming gut microbial diversity. So parallel rodent work shows that coffee melanoidins actually thicken the mucus layer and it suppresses opportunistic pathogens from taking hold in the gut. And coffee dose does matter. The sweet spot appears to be two to four cups a day. That range reliably enriches short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria while keeping the pro-inflammatory strains in check. Go much higher and the data gets noisy and diversity shifts are study dependent. So I think the key takeaway here is that coffee, caffeinated or decaffeinated, acts as a prebiotic matrix. It has fibers, melanoidins, and polyphenols that feed the gut ecosystem that in turn generate metabolites linked to lower inflammation, better, better cholesterol handling, and neuroprotection. So the next time you're having your coffee, remember, you're not just stimulating your brain, you're actually feeding an entire microbial network in your gut that may be central to coffee's longevity signal.